appreciation of him shall be sweet because I love him. I will give my heart in celebration. Lift my voice on high. Make a joyful note. Well, 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 good morning, good morning. So good to have you with me today. This is a beautiful day, beautiful Memorial Day weekend here in Miami, Florida, broadcasting live from the 305. Let me remind you, you are more than your body. You're more than the limitations of your body. You are more than the limitations of your current beliefs. And as you begin to understand that, you will enter into a new dimension, which we call the Christ life. That's that life that God talks about in Scripture called the Zoe, the God kind of life. Well, it's a great day, and I want to just take a couple of moments. We want to pray and take a moment of silence and prayer for, obviously, the families in Texas that have lost their children and family members. A absolute horrible tragedy this week, one in which uh, we hope and pray never happens again. So let's just pray. Father, I just release my faith, Lord, right now. Father, we don't understand why or how all of these things occur. But Father, I know that you have received those young babies, those children into heaven. And God, I pray that your blessings would be upon their family, their friends, their relatives. Bring healing to them. Bring healing to that city. And Father, we ask you to just to bring peace and peace and safety into this nation, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've got a couple of things we want to do today. One of the things is we want to remember that this is, indeed, this is um, Memorial Day weekend. And so we want to just take a moment and... As to why for so many years we achieved so much, prospered as no other people on earth, it was because here in this land... We unleash the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. Those who say that we're in a time when there are no heroes They just don't know where to look. The sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery, with its row upon row of simple white markers, bearing crosses or stars of David, they add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. Each one of those markers is a monument to the kind of hero I spoke of earlier. Their lives ended in places called Bello Wood, the Argonne, Omaha Beach, Salerno, and halfway around the world on Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Porkchop Hill, the Chosin Reservoir, and in a hundred rice paddies and jungles of a place called Vietnam. Under one such marker lies a young man, Martin Treptow who left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France with the famed Rainbow Division. There on the Western Front, he was killed trying to carry a message between battalions under heavy artillery fire. We're told that on his body was found a diary. On the flyleaf, under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words. America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. 
we must realize that no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. It is a weapon our adversaries in today's world do not have. It is a weapon that we as Americans do have. Let that be understood by those who practice terrorism and prey upon their neighbors. As for the enemies of freedom, those who are potential adversaries, they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. We will negotiate for it, sacrifice for it. We will not surrender for it now or ever. We are Americans. And let me remind you that we have a live service every Sunday morning at 1047 at 9775 Southwest 87th Avenue here in beautiful Miami, Florida. We meet at the Riviera School Auditorium. It is the same location our church has been meeting at for the last 40 years. Uh, what happened is we were able to go into a relationship with Riviera. They uh, build out the school that we had been believing God for that uh, obviously, I was not unable. I was unable at the time to be able to fulfill that vision. But they came in, fulfilled the exact vision that God had given me for a school, a a absolutely fantastic educational program, and at the same time, we're able to meet there every Sunday morning at ten forty seven. Bring your friends, bring your family, join with us. Now, before we get started today, let me do a couple of things to remind you that we will be receiving communion at the end of this transmission. So please go ahead, get your bread, get your bread, and uh, get your wine, and uh, we're going to receive communion at the end of this presentation. So with that in mind, be ready, be ready, and be ready. Please take a moment. I... I would have greatly appreciate if you would share this transmission. The easiest way for us to continue to grow our audience is for you to be able to share on your social media, share on your Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you can share the link. Subscribe, please. We need everyone to subscribe. And there's a, you know, it's not a matter of um, <laughs> saying, oh, we've got X number of subscribers. No. What happens is as we get to a certain level of subscriptions, YouTube opens up many more avenues for us to be able to transmit and to be able to um, build our, our audience. Now, we also broadcast on Rumble. We broadcast on Byte, uh, BitChute, rather. We broadcast on MeWe. We broadcast as many places as we can in order to reach the gospel of Jesus Christ with people all over the world. Now, today... We have, in fact, what we've done is we've broadcast and we've shared an announcement with what the teaching is today. And the teaching is about it isn't over until God says it's over. So it's not over until God says oh it's over.
And we're going to, in fact, take a passage of Scripture, uh, 1 Kings chapter 6, 1 Kings chapter, uh, or 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7. So let me get the chapters right so that you can join with us. Now, we're not going to go through every one of the passages of Scripture today. We'll highlight those texts and give you, a, and I think, a greater appreciation of where we are in a world situation compared to what we see in the book of 2 Kings chapter 6 and chapter 7. There's extreme amount of parallels there. And uh, one of the problems I have is, is, you know, I have people, you know, it's... It's quite interesting. Uh, people are people are funny. They want to hear what they want to hear. Uh, I have people say, I only want to hear a positive message. Well, you know what? Any basic student of the Bible, any basic student of the Bible, will realize, in fact, the Bible is not all positive. It does have a lot of positive information there, but the truth is it is tells you about what real life is all about. So it isn't over until God says it's over. And that's what you need to understand. Long before the beginning of all other beginnings, God is. In a burst of creative activity, God creates the world and everything in it. Humans are designed to live inside of this unique relationship, but they choose otherwise. The law of God is broken, and the heart of God is pierced. But the story isn't over. In the fullness of time, God gives His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Jesus comes to seek and save those who are lost. Wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. On the cross, God is in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathes his last. But the story isn't over. On the morning of the third day, the power of the living God erupts breaking through death with the moment that will define all other moments. Perched at the edge of heaven, the angels stand in awe as one of their own rolls away the stone that's guarding the body of Jesus. As if anything can guard Jesus. He walks out of the tomb alive. He is victorious. He is conquering death and rendering the grave unnecessary. He is living and moving and breathing as only the risen Son of God can. But the story isn't over. We are, every one of us, searching and hoping and longing for life. It's a desire that's been deposited into our souls by the very same God who spoke it all into existence. And it's this exact life that the resurrection of Jesus invites us into. So bring your hopes, your regrets, your successes and your failures. Bring your doubts, your joys, your fears and your dreams. Be resolute and unwilling to settle for anything less than the abundant life of the risen King. Because truly, if the story isn't over, then what happens next might just change everything. That's right. It is not over until God says it's over. So we're looking at a world situation. We're in a world crisis, not just a national crisis, but a world crisis. For the last two and a half years, I've been sharing with you my concerns and my understanding of what is about to happen and what has happened. And through the last two and a half years, I've attempted to try to warn you, prepare you, and get you ready for the next phase of what's going on in our culture and in our world. Now, 
I'm not going to continue teaching all about what you need to be doing because you already know. If you've been listening to our broadcast, you know what you need to be doing. You need to have a a food storage, a pantry. You need to have water. You need to have uh, energy source. Things that you know that you need to have in place. Now, as I shared last year, I said that the food prices would go up 50%. And if you were going to, the best investment that you could possibly make would be a food storage. Then I told you that gas prices would go up to $7.50. That is going to happen this year as they continue in the plan to begin to create a world crisis, to create world destruction, and to create a depopulation program leading up until what uh, I believe God is going to have us be in, in a time of where the body of Christ must rise up. Isaiah chapter 61 and chapter 62 says, Gross darkness is on the land, but the brightness and the glory of the Lord will rise upon his people. So rise and shine. So the whole reality of what I've been sharing with you is that we're not going to fix this politically. It's just not going to happen. I know some of you saying, well, we've got to support politicians. We've got to support Trump. We've got to support this person. We've got to support the No, what we need to do is support Jesus Christ. Because the scripture says of his government, there is no end. It is the government of Christ. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom without end. Now, whatever we do in the natural and whatever we do in the political realm and the natural realm, as it applies to the kingdom of God, that's all well and good. But the idea that some Christians have that they're waiting for a, a change in the politics in Washington, a change in the poli- You see, it's not simply about Washington. This week, you had in Davos, you had the World Economic Forum meeting, making plans. These are the uber leaders. These are the leaders over the leaders. These are the ones that are controlling the governments, the presidents, the kings, the princes uh, all around the world. And some of you, if you don't understand that, go right back. I have a video that I said, the puppet masters. You can go back in our archives and you can watch that. It's called the puppet masters. Who are they? What do they do and what do they want? So one of those things that uh, is happening in um, Davos is very, very interesting. Uh, They recently had the CEO of Pfizer. And remember, I told you that COVID was not about the virus. It was about a vaccination ID system and that COVID had some other problems involved with it. Now, let me just share with you something that I think you'll be blessed with. Uh, Well, you're not going to be blessed. This is going to open up your eyes. Basically, biological chip that it is in the tablet and once you take the tablet and dissolves into your stomach sec- sends a signal that you took the tablet so imagine the applications of that uh, compliance uh, the insurance companies to know that the medicines that patients should take they do take them uh, it is uh, fascinating what happens in in uh, this field <laughs> Now, you can get that entire video on YouTube. You can go to band.video. These are, in fact, uh, videos that will, 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 will help you. Okay? Now, one an- another thing that I want to share with you is that, as the CEO of Pfizer said, they have created and are creating pills that once you ingest them, it will send out a transmission. Now, someone says, how is it, how is it going to transmit? Because it will have nanotechnology, nanotechnology. This is why I was concerned and still am concerned about all of the lipid nanoparticles that were in and are in all of the vaccination. This is a system of transmission and a system that goes both ways, transmission and reception into your body. So this is what the scripture's been warned about. This is what the scripture talks about. and But it's not something that um, you and I can do much about at this point, other than trust God, don't, don't get involved with their system. Uh, at this point in my life, anything that comes from Pfizer, uh, I have a real difficulty even considering 
putting it in or ingesting it in my body. He told you what they're going to do. So uh, unless you want to be hooked up to a hive system, into a internet connected system, your physical body, uh, I, don't do it. Okay, so these are things that you need to look at. Now, God is still in control. So let's don't miss what our topic is today. Let's go right on into it right now. And as we look at this, we need to understand God, it's not over. God is still in control. And guess what? It's not over until God says it's over. One of the most important parts of this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at today in 2 Kings chapter 6 and chapter 7, we have the prophet Elisha. Not Elijah, Elisha. We talked about Elijah a couple of weeks ago, but Elisha, who was the uh, trainee, in fact, took over the prophet, uh, school of the prophets after Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind in a chariot. Now, at the same time, what you need to understand is that during this time, there was a war going on, there was famine going on, there was gross murders and, and, and killings going on. And in the midst of all of this, God uses the prophet to begin to bring balance and reality to the situation. So in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse number 16, it says, Fear not, for they that are with us are more than they that are with them. They that are with us are more than they that are with us. Stop the fear. Listen to me. Stop the fear. You know, the Bible, literally, the Bible it talks about fear not, or the concept of not fearing, over 365 times. In other words, he has put in the Word of God a fear not command for you every day of the year. Fear not. I have people ask me, say, are you afraid to die? And that's not about me being afraid to die. I'm not afraid to die. If I die, that's gain. The Bible says for me to die is to gain. But Paul also said for me to live is for the benefit of the body of Christ. You know, obviously, I still have a work to do here on this planet. I'm here sharing with you, and I'm believing God that you're receiving the impartation of what the heart of God is in our meetings, okay? So the truth is, you and I, you need to shout out, it is not over. Shout out, it is not over. God is in control. Now, let me remind you, and I'm not going to go into all the scripture there. I want you to read it yourself. We literally have a siege in the city of on Israel by the Syrians and what they had done they had literally surrounded the city of Jerusalem and they were starving out the people now as Elijah and his servant his servant began to fear his servant was concerned because all he could see was the enemies the armies of the enemy surrounding and he was absolutely in distress. Now, it's easy to get that way now, particularly if you're watching the news regularly, particularly if you're watching uh, the media who are telling you, let me just tell you something very carefully. If you haven't figured it out yet, let me make it very clear. Almost everything, let me repeat that, almost everything you hear on legacy media it is, the truth is absolutely the opposite. Just for example, the tragedy that we had here in, in, the, in Texas just a few days ago. Initially, the response came out one way. Then the next day it was changed. Then the next day. And here we are several days later and the story continues to change. So you need to understand what they report on is they are reporting, not on facts many times, they're reporting on what is will sell, what will sizzle, what will get, put the clicks on the website. And it's days and sometimes weeks. And as you see, even in the issue of the election, it's years later to where they prove that what they were saying was not true. So now the scripture says, 
as the enemy far outnumbered the Jewish troops, leaving the people in despair. And Elisha offers a simple prayer. Lord, open our eyes that we may see. At that moment, the spiritual army was revealed to his servant. The servant sees things that previously he was blinded to. And his attitude transforms from hopelessness into hopefulness. It is amazing how open your eyes to see on a different dimension can change your perspective. And that's why we've told you over and over, if you're constantly looking at media, you're constantly looking at the internet, you're listening to a legacy media that's filling you with all of the fear. Now, there's a lot of things to be concerned about. I'm not, I'm not downplaying any of it. Coronavirus is a, it, 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 it's not, it's nothing to sneeze at. As you know, I got over, my family got over coronavirus about a month ago, and it's not something that's uh, fun to go through. But thank God we didn't, have not, and will not take the vaccination, which in my opinion, just in my opinion, there are greater problems with that than there is having the COVID. Now, you're looking right now as what's going on in Davos, and I would encourage you, go to YouTube, Google the speeches and the presentations of those world leaders at the World Economic Forum. Listen to what they're telling you. They are telling you in advance what their plans are and what they intend to do. Now, one of those things is, as we're getting kind of getting into a new level right now, how many know that we have the monkeypox coming up next? Now, what's interesting about this is last year, last year, monkeypox was in, and I'll, I can show it to you later. In a simulation, was going to be released in that simulation on March 15, 2022. This happened, the simulation last year, early last year. Now, how did they know that monkeypox would be released in the month of March? So, the beginning of this month, all of a sudden, now we're starting to hear about monkeypox. Why is it that the United States government? has already pre-ordered 13 million vaccinations for monkeypox. Because this is the next plan to bring in fear, to bring in trauma, to bring in... And let me tell you something. Um, (laughs) If you know anything now about vaccinations, that's another one of those things I'm running completely away from, okay? Okay. Don't buy. You know what? Let me just tell you something. You have an immune system. You have an immune system that God gave you. And that immune system, if you take care of your body, if you take the proper nutrients, eat the right food, take the vitamins, take the supplements, do the things that you need to do to build your immune system, your body will fight off almost every disease known to man. And that's the truth. And those diseases which go past that immune system is the result of you doing something that's lowered the immune system. And that's just literally the truth. So what happens is you have to work on building your natural immunity. That's why, for example, uh, and it's, it's quite amazing to me. You see mothers today, and they have a newborn baby. Oh, my God. You know, don't allow them to get on the floor. Don't allow them to touch the dirt. Don't allow them to do... No, you don't understand. You got people who are, they're sanitizing their... They get a newborn baby, they're sanitizing everything. They're they're disinfecting, making sure there's no bacteria. No, no, no. God gave you an immune system that needs to be built. And that's what happens when you're a kid. And and I'm going to be honest with you. Um... (laughs) This may sound like a joke, but it's not a joke. As a young boy, six, five, six years old, I lived in Marion, Indiana, Spencer Avenue, and right across the street from my house was a park, and in that park ran a river, the Mississippi River. And in that river, we used to swim all the time. I mean, literally swim. We would fish there. The kids would... Now, we didn't understand what we were doing. 
I'm serious. We didn't understand it. But there was a absolute raw sewage port. I mean, it was as big as, I'm, I'm going to say the, it was a concrete pipe that led out into uh, the river. And the dimension of the concrete pipe was probably 48 inches. Okay. And we, on top of that, we would get on top of that concrete pipe and we would dive into the river and swim. And guess what? Literally, raw sewage, <laughs> raw sewage was coming out, and you could see it, but it didn't stop us. I mean, if you really understood that we didn't get sick, we didn't get all, I mean, that doesn't mean people can't get sicker from that circumstance, but literally it started building our immune system. I'm not telling you go take a swim in raw sewage. Don't, don't listen to me on that level. I, that's just something we did as stupid kids. I mean, we used to do stupid stuff, and, and uh, thank God we lived through them. I'll give you a perfect example of what people go through today. They tell you don't drink out of a garden hose because we used to drink out of the garden hose every single day. And any of you my age, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We didn't have bicycle helmets. We didn't have all of the issues that, that are going on today because we literally, two things. Number one, I, I remember when I first started to ride a bicycle, uh, I didn't know how to ride it, didn't have anybody teach me to ride it, didn't, have, didn't grow up with a father, but I got a bicycle. And I literally got on it and coasted down a hill um, close to my house, didn't know how to stop it, so I would jump off before it inter went into the intersection. I mean, do you understand what happens when you jump off a bicycle that's rolling and you're jumping off onto a asphalt pavement? We came home, we had our scrapes, we had our bruises, but you know what? We learned how to ride the bicycle. The same thing happened with most of everything in our lives. We learned, and a lot of times we had issues, but we lived through it. So one of the things you need to understand is all of the fear that's going to be going on in the next few weeks and months, it is designed. It is a plan. It is a plan to be able to put into place the next level. And all you have to do is read The Great Reset by Klaus Schwab, The Fourth Industrial Revolution by Klaus Schwab, uh, 1984. Okay, Alex uh, Huxley's uh, Brave New World. And you'll understand where everyone is trying to get us to. Now, open our eyes. Open our eyes to see. You see, now, you can see, and it seems like it's easy to see all the negative things around us. It is so easy. And the reason it's easy is because that's what the media, literally, the media literally capitalize on. Now, let me go back for a moment. Do you remember, now, some of you may be not as old as I, I know I'm, I don't look as old as I actually am, uh, you know, but that's that's a good thing. But when I was growing up in the newspaper, you would have positive things. You would have a lead article on the front page of a kid's plane. In fact, I remember the Marion Chronicle. I was on the front page of the Marion Chronicle with a bunch of kids, and we were playing marbles. And I know someone says, what is marbles today? Most kids don't even know what that is all about, but some of you know. But you would always have good report you'd have the you'd have marriages and you'd have the birth announcements you'd have all of these things and you would see the same thing on your local television now after the consolidation of media what i mean by that is there basically are no more local newspapers or local magazines in fact just uh, yesterday i was in 711 and i looked at the newsstand, and here was the Miami Herald that, I mean, the Miami Herald used to be thick. I mean, it, it used to be an inch thick. It wasn't an eighth of an inch thick. And the reason for it is they moved online. You don't have the media, the television, the radio station. These are controlled by large corporate entities designed and bringing all of the resources together to control the narrative of what you and I hear. So it's easy to get the negative, and it seems like it's easy to see the irritating qualities of other people. And it seems like it's easy also to see our own faults. And no wonder 
we start getting desperate and fall in despair. We need to say the Elisha prayer. Lord, open my eyes. Say it with me. Lord, open my eyes to see. To see what? The beauty of those I live with. My family, my friends, my co-workers, my church, my community. Lord, open my eyes to the simple beauty of life, the warmth of the sun, the cool of the breeze and the colors of the summer, and the glory of the star-studded night. Lord, open my eyes. Come on, say it with me again. Lord, open my eyes. You know, <clears throat> we taught a whole teaching, a series of teaching on uh, eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive out of Matthew chapter 13. Jesus says that there are certain groups of people who don't have the eyes to see, they don't have the ears to hear, and even if they saw it or heard it, they don't even believe it. But you are part of the family of God. You're part of the kingdom of God, those eyes that you have. And what do I'm talking about eyes to see? Just as the servant with Elisha, he could see in the natural all of the enemy. He could see the famine. He could see the sickness. He could see the disease. He could see the poverty. In fact, it got so desperate in First or Second Kings chapter 6. Read at the bottom of the chapter. People were so desperate that a woman came to the king begging and begging because she had made a deal with a friend of hers that they would kill their child and eat their children. And she had, they had killed and eaten her child, but the other woman the next day had hidden her son. It had become so desperate. Listen, I pray that it doesn't get this desperate. But it became so desperate, people had resorted to cannibalism. Think about it. In fact, 2 Kings chapter 7, the Bible talks about that there would come a time in which I mean, people would uh, eat dung and they would eat uh, bird droppings, all of these things. But you also notice in 2 Kings chapter 7, there were the lepers who were on the outside of the gate. They were starving too. But you know what? They decided one time, they said, you know what? We can sit here and we can do nothing and we can just sit here and die. He says, or we can go down to the camp of the enemy if they receive us, maybe they'll give us something to eat. And if they don't and they kill us, we're still dead. Do you understand? They made a choice. They made a decision that they were not going to stay in their current position. That's why I've entreated you. I've encouraged you over and over for the last two years. Make preparations so no matter what happens, you can possibly mitigate the consequences. Do you know the, re the reality is, people ask the question, where is the God of Elisha? Where is the God of Elisha in this time? Well, the question really should be, where are the Elishas of God? Let me repeat that. The question is not, where is the God of Elisha? The question is, where are the Elishas of God? Big difference on how you see that. You need to understand the God of Elisha is still present. The God of Elisha is still in control. That's why I titled this teaching today. It's not over until God says it's over. And you know, God chose you and I. This is what some of us don't really appreciate. Out of the 7.9 billion people that are currently on the planet... Out of the thousands of years and the billions of people who lived on this planet, you and I have been predestinated. We have been set into motion for this time to go through these adversities, but not just to be defeated by the adversity, but to come through those adversities in faith, in power, trusting that God is going to make provision for us. So, Lord, I pray right now, open our eyes to see. Open my eyes to see the beauty of myself, my sight, my taste, my hearing, my senses, 
my beating heart, my expanding and contracting lungs, my laughter, my image reflected in the love of compassion and love. Lord, open my eyes to help me to see in the mirror the marvelous creation you have crafted in me. Lord, open my eyes to see you, your endless and immeasurable and immense love. Lord, open my eyes to hope, to the reality and the certainty that you have a plan for mankind. There are beautiful things all around us that we just don't see. Our lives have been cluttered with pain, hurt, doubt that blind us to the beauty we don't give and that we don't give it up too easily. I I know it's there. It's closer than you think. Maybe it's staring right in your face. How many of you have gone into your own house and you've become so aware or so used to your own house? This happened to me the other day. I'd taken down some curtains and uh, they need to be thrown away. They're old, dirty. So I took them down and I put them in a place. And I rather than throwing them away, I just set them in that particular location. Well, now this was weeks ago. Now, it was just as easy for me to walk through the house with those drapes, throw them in the trash can and get rid of them. But I didn't. And so just yesterday... I was walking through the house, and exactly where I'd placed them, they were still there. But I had gotten so used to them being there, I quit seeing them. Do you hear what I just said? I got so used to them being there, I quit seeing them. We do this with all of our senses. Those of you that have a child, a baby, who's crying... Versus the person that doesn't have a baby. The mother that has the baby crying and screaming. She's able to tune it out. But then someone who doesn't have a newborn baby. Gets around that crying baby. And they can tolerate it for only so long. And then they start to just to go off. And that's true with what we see. With what we hear. With what we taste. Everything about us. We become accustomed to the norm And we forget to see the abnormal, the supernatural, the things of God. Now, look at this passage in this thing. When the servant's eyes were open, the servant saw the reality that he could not see before. He saw that there was really more with him and Elisha than those assembled against them. You see, the previous lack of perception on the part of Elisha's servant did not make the reality of the spiritual army any less real. Let me repeat that. The lack of perception on the part of Elisha's servant did not make the reality of the spiritual army any less real. If there are 50 people, who do not see something, it does not invalidate the perception of one who does see. This, this is where I, I get into a point where those of you understand how you can enter into that next dimension, enter into that Christ life, as you can go into uh, vision, you can go, and you do it in dreams, but you know people don't understand how you can have visions and have your eyes open and see things. All of a sudden, when you enter into that level of scene, you're entering into a scene in the next dimension. And you begin to see things. You begin to see that indeed God is in control. Now, I had somebody ask me, they, they say, oh, man, we don't want to, we, that's scary. You don't want to go out there and, and see stuff. You know, I mean, there's demons out there. No, what you're going to see as a Bible-believing Christian is you're going to see the glory of God and his host of angels. So, faith is never the imagining of unreal things. It is the grip of things which cannot be demonstrated to the senses, but which are real. The chariots uh, and of horses and fire were actually real 
regardless of whether or not the servant could see them. And that is true with you. We're looking at a world with a pandemic. We're looking at the next thing with monkey virus. We're looking at recession. We're looking at uh, economies collapsing and situations occurring. And at the same time, you can look at all of that and walk in fear. But as Elisha said, fear not. Because greater are those that are with us than those that are with the enemy. And on top of that, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you. Say that's with me. Greater is he that's in me. Come on. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. So it's not a matter of you fearful. It's a matter of realizing and opening your perspective and perception of what the reality of the spirit realm and how God is manipulating and controlling everything on this planet. You see, faith operates in another dimension reality. If our eyes were open, we would see the angel host as an encircling fence of fire. But whether you see them or not, they are most certainly there. Did you see what I'm saying? Now, the Bible says we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, that we have angels protecting us, guiding us. I mean, that's all the time. And some of you don't live like you believe that angels are there to protect you, but indeed they are. Look at this. In 1 Kings chapter 6, or 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7, miracles took place. The axe head was made to swim. The servant's eyes were open. He could see the chariots of angels. He could see, and Elisha blinded the Syrian army and laid, led them into Samaria. The king of Syria besieges Israel, and there's massive death and famine. But God was still in control. It's not over until God says it over. But we get to, <coughs> we get to the point at the end of 2 Kings chapter 7, where we start to see the miracle and the redemption of God. Let me remind you, it ain't over until God says it's over. It's not over until God says it's over. It doesn't matter what it looks like. You see, <coughs> 2 Kings chapter 7, verse number 19, God had made a promise. God makes a promise. But it was up to the lepers to make the choice. They could sit there and die, or they could move forward. Every current shortage, and I want to tell you this because you need to understand this. In the next few weeks, the next few months, there will be a massive transfer of wealth. Now, you need to understand that massive transfer can be negative from you or can be positive. If you look at the shortages and you see the shortages as obstacles rather than opportunities, every shortage, every shortage in this crisis is an opportunity. Now, the question is, in those choices, and as we move forward at the end of 2022, God's promises are still valid. God said he will make you the head and not the tail. That he'll promise he's bless you. Everything you put to hand to will prosper and succeed. He says he'll open up the windows of heaven to those who are tithers and, believe, and, and givers. But you must make the choice to accept the promise and then to act upon them. You make the decision. Carefully listen to this. What opportunities can you see and opportunities for you? <clears throat> Every crisis provides God's provision if you can see them. The question is, what are you seeing? Are you seeing a world of lack or are you seeing a world of amazing abundance? Are your eyes open? And let me ask you a question. If your eyes were open, 
What do you think you could see? <clears throat> do you understand there is no limit to how much oil and gas is in America? Do you know we have over 200 years supply of oil in America that could supply the entire world? Do you realize two years ago we were a net importer, exporter rather, of oil. Now we're an importer of oil. What changed? What changed was this was a man-made crisis and shortage based upon a philosophical and a political worldview. Just this last couple of weeks, let me get a little drink here. <coughs> I still have this little cough. The last few weeks, we've seen a shortage of infant formula. Was there a shortage in Europe? No. Was there a shortage in Mexico? No. Why was there a shortage? It was a political decision to create shortages and rather than to create the infant formula. To create the crisis, and if you'll understand how this works... You, these political entities create the crisis so that they can come in with what they believe is the solution so that you'll continue to vote for them. This is the way this thing works. There was no real shortage of infant formula in America. It was a man-made restrictions upon the companies. There's not a, there's not a shortage of oil. There's not a shortage of food. What we have is a man-made pandemic, man-made scarcity that's taking place. Part of that is to begin to vertically, vertically integrate and to break down uh, all of the problems in the, in the middle class and to integrate it and bring all it up to those social elites. But you need to understand there are no limits with God. There are no limitations. Say that with me. There are no limits with God. Come on. No limits with God. There are no limitations. The limitations that we're seeing and experiencing in our society right now have been created by a political system. Not j and I'm not talking about Republicans. I'm not talking about Democrats. Because you know my opinion of both of them. They're both basically the same. And that's why I say, if you think that if all of a sudden the Republicans get the House and the Senate, that all of a sudden everything's going to go back, or even if the president changes, you have basically, and I told you this illustration, you have the Republicans are Coca-Cola, red can. You have the Democrats, the Pepsi-Cola, the blue can. You pour them in empty glasses, separate glasses, 99% of the people testing them can't taste the difference whether it's a Pepsi or a Coke. That's the way our two-party system is working. There's almost no differences between their positions. Why? Because they are all a part of the same system that's, in, that's rewarding them for their consistency to support this massive system, which that Uber system of the world economic form. Now, I don't have time to go into that, but hopefully some of you are getting red-pilled and you understand what is indeed going on. But the reality is, God is still in control, okay? So, and God is always and will always be faithful.
<coughs> his faithfulness is firmly fixed in the heavens. We're going to go ahead and receive communion now. Before I do, I want to ask if there may be someone here that you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you have not, please say this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I believe that you died on the cross of Calvary, that you were buried and rose from the dead. And now I confess you with my mouth. I believe in my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that simple little prayer, the next step that you need to do is you need to find a good Bible-based church. If you're in the Miami area, please come and join our church. It be an honor to have you join with us. The next thing you need to do is, is you should be baptized in water by complete immersion and then begin to start your journey of understanding what the Christ life is all about. It's a wonderful journey. Got a lot, of, a lot of interesting things that we go through. But bless God, God is still in control. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, <coughs> he took bread. He blessed it and he broke it. and said, take, eat. <coughs> Excuse me. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Receive the bread today in Jesus' name. After the same manner also he took the cup, saying, This is the blood of the New Testament. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we receive the cup of Christ. Remission of sins and reconciliation with God the Father. We receive that now in Jesus' name. Receive with the cup. Amen. And you know what? You could trust God to believe God for all of the blessings of God in your life. And I want to just share with you before we leave today. One of the most important things you can do, even in, in all of the economic problems and economic situations, is you need to learn to trust God by giving. Here's a beautiful song by Kenneth Copeland. I bet it'll bless you. There are people never receiving anything from God at all. They are shaken in their believing when they don't see results. They quickly fall. But don't you waver. On living in the way God wants you to. Don't get discouraged. Keep on giving. Soon it will come back to you. You gotta keep on casting your bread upon the water. Soon it's gonna come back home on every way. You gotta keep on casting your bread upon the water. Soon it's gonna come back home on every way. Good measure, press down, shaken together, running over. Soon it's gonna come back home. Keep on casting. Keep on working for the kingdom. Amen. As you, we are going to wrap this up today, once again, I want to wish you a safe and happy Memorial Day. Remember, this is a day in which we honor, give thanks for those men and women who gave their all that we might exercise our freedoms today. 
I want to remind you also that we have live services every Sunday morning at 1047 at 9775 Southwest 87th Avenue here in Miami, Florida at Riviera School. In the auditorium, you're welcome to come. Bring your friends, bring your family, and bring any questions that you might have. I usually take a time where I, people can ask questions in our live presentation. And uh, I'm going to just make you a bold statement. I don't care what the question is. I don't care how difficult the question is. I can answer it. But you got to be there Sunday morning for me to answer that scripture or answer the questions. It doesn't matter what the topic is. Now, you may not believe that's possible. But if you want to find out, bring me a question you think that I cannot answer. And I'll give you the answer. Okay? So, please join with me. Plan on giving, sharing this link with others around. I thank you so much for being with me today. Remember, I love you, Jesus loves you, and Jesus is Lord. Keep on casting your bread upon the water. Remember, you can give by using the QR code, simply scan it, or you can give by texting 73256, 73256, Christ Life Center in one word, and you will be directed by a menu. You can give by whatever methodology you would like. God bless you. Thank you for being with me. Jesus is Lord.